this Practicing the Way series, and we're doing a mini-series on prayer. You'll recall two weeks ago, Pastor Mitch introduced the series and gave the first message on talking to God. And then Nathaniel gave us a wonderful message last week on talking with God. Well, today's message is listening to God. And uh, Tundi was talking about how Pastor Mitch um, essentially had to practice what he was preaching by taking a Sabbath rest bit. And so also, as I was preparing this message, I also needed to practice what I will be preaching by trying to hear from God what it is that he wanted to have said to the church. When I think about someone who can listen to God, I think about a man who is just like us. I think about a man called Elijah. And I'd like you, if you have your uh, Bibles with you or your handheld devices, to turn or, or swipe in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. And if you read a little before that in chapter 18, you'll find Elijah, the prophet of God, on Mount Carmel. And he, inc- he was able to defeat the prophets of Baal. Now, Baal was the Canaanite god of thunder. And for some reason, all of Israel had followed after Baal, which is a slap in God's face, of course, because Israel was God's chosen people. And finally, Elijah gathered the people of Israel, including 450 prophets of Baal, and he challenged them. He said, choose. If, if God is God, then serve him. If Baal is God, then serve him. And he had this competition with the prophets of Baal, to which, of course, God was victorious, and the prophets of Baal were wiped out. That's an incredible victory. And then following that, Elijah prayed. And there had been a, a famine going on in the land for the past seven years. And Elijah prayed, and the rains came and the famine ended. And another incredible victory. Now we find ourselves in chapter 19. And the man of God from chapter 18 was suddenly facing a crisis. And we see in chapter 19, um, and we can, if you read the first few verses, you'll see that Queen Jezebel was furious with Elijah for having the prophets of Baal killed. And so she sent him a message, basically telling Elijah that she's going to make sure that he too is going to be killed. And so Elijah, how did he respond? Well, you would think that he would respond in the same power that he had already been managing for the rest of chapter 18, but no. Somehow that broke him. Somehow that message... Uh, And not only that message, but somehow he had in his head that his ministry to the people of Israel was worthless, was useless. All the work that he had been doing so, so zealously, so jealously for God had amounted to nothing. And so he ran. That was his response to Queen Jezebel. He ran south. He ran to the southern border of, of Israel, past that southern border of Judah, and at that point, he dismissed his servant, which was an indication that he's chosen to leave his prophetic ministry. And he kept on running south into the desert, into the the peninsula of, of Sinai. And he went all the way south to Horeb. Mount Horeb is called the mountain of God. And we pick up the story in verse 9 where it says, there he came to a cave and lodged in it. And I'm going to pause for a second there. The, you see, the, the passage says, a cave. In fact, th- th- this passage was written in Hebrew originally. And in the re- original Hebrew, it doesn't say a cave. It says the cave. And so we find Elijah at the mountain of God in the cave. The cave is likely referring to the same place that God revealed himself to Moses 500 years earlier when Moses said, show me your glory. And God put him in 
the special place. And so we have the same God. We have the same place and a different prophet. And here we have Elijah in the cave. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? It was a good question. Elijah's ministry was to Israel. And he was far from Israel at this point. Sometimes God leads with a question when we go to him. Now, it's interesting that God would ask Elijah, what are you doing here? Is it possible that God had no idea what was going on in Elijah's life? Mm, Unlikely. Recall when Moses was talking with God, God asked Moses, what's that in your hand? Is it possible that God had no idea what Moses was was holding? Mm, Not likely. Sometimes God leads with a question when we meet with him. And the question isn't because he doesn't know the answer. The question is because he wants us to face and to deal with the issues. And sometimes the question's an awkward one. What are you doing here, Elijah? In verse 10, he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, killed your, all your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek to take my life. So Elijah was despondent. Elijah was discouraged. Elijah was defeated. The prophet of God, the man of God who had that mountaintop experience at Mount Carmel, was now defeated. And he was under the impression that despite all his hard work, his ministry was for nothing. We need to be careful of allowing those little lies to sink into our spirit. The lies that'll tell us that all that labor was just in vain. The lies that'll tell us that you are the only one left. Here's a word. You're not alone. You're not the only one left. No one who leaves All these things, family, friends, for the sake of the Lord, will not cease to receive a hundredfold in this life, as well as eternal life in the life to come. Jesus himself promised, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And it's a lie of the enemy that tells you that you're out on your own, that you're alone. Never listen to those lies. Well, In verses 11 and 12, it says, And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. I remember him passing by in that same place before. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind... An earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And in the King James Version, it'll, you'll see it translated as a still, small voice. And those words, still, small voice, or low It's actually two words in the Hebrew. And the words give a connotation of something so fine, it's like dust. And so if you put your fingers up to your ear and you, you listen, you'll hear just a fine, fine sound. And Elijah noticed that sound. And he knew that the Lord was in it. He didn't sense God in any of those powerful displays. And God did all that to show Elijah 
that God is not limited to only the spectacular. He's not limited to just the big voice. He's not limited to those big events. But God is right there to meet with us wherever we find ourselves. Yes, Mount Carmel. Yes, he's, he's in the mountaintop. Yes, he'd be, he'd be with us when we're, when, let's say, gathered at the front of the church after one of Pastor Mitch's incredible sermons. Yes, he's, he's there during those experiences, of course. He's also there as we're on our way to work or school, walking down the road, riding the bus, driving the car. He's also there in the valley of the shadow of death. He's also there during the night of sorrows. He's there in the mundane places as well. Isaiah 30 talks about how we will hear a voice. We won't see where it's coming from. It'll sound like it's coming from behind us, in fact. And that voice will give us a message. This is the way. Walk in it. Oh, how many times? How many times can I tell you that? And and probably you as well have noticed that you'd be going along in a certain direction, a certain line of thought, and you'll sense, this is the way. Walk in it. Oh, we need to be so sensitive to that. Well, verses 13 and 14. And when Elijah heard that low whisper, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I, even I only, am left. And they seek to take my life, to take it away. So now, now it's a little bit different. Now we have Elijah in reverence, pulling his cloak over his face. In reverence. But God's question was still the same. It's interesting because at the beginning of verse of chapter 19, in the first few verses, we see Elijah on his way to Horeb. He actually encountered an angel of the Lord twice on the way. I I didn't bother reading that, but that that was on the journey there. And then he went through all this and heard that gentle, that low whisper. But the question's still the same. None of those encounters with God changed the situation for Elijah. (laughs) You see, God was showing Elijah something with the display of his power. Elijah was, Elijah had a plan for the people of Israel. Elijah was expecting that God would punish them by tearing up the land. God expected that, Elijah expected that God would, would send an earthquake to just swallow the people up. And then after this, all the people are swallowed up, that God would send a fire down to cleanse the land of all the wickedness in it. But God was showing Elijah that he had a very different plan for the people of Israel. And we find that Elijah is now in a position to listen. What keeps us from listening to God? There's many things that would keep us from listening to God. And I examine my own heart 
as I prepared this sermon. And I came up with three main areas. Pride, distractions, and presumptions. For pride, we see that Elijah mistakenly thought that he was bearing the burden of ministry on his own. And that became a burden that he was no longer able to bear. It was an unbearable burden. He mistakenly thought that it was all him, I, and only I. So we see Elijah's pride. Somehow he thought that Israel's future was riding on Elijah's shoulders. And it's when our focus comes off of God and on to our own ability that we become deaf to God's guidance. There's a passage in Zechariah chapter 4. And it says, Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Now Zerubbabel was, um, he was essentially a governor of, of Judea at the time. Say with me Zerubbabel. Zer- well, I'll try again. Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a lovely word. It's a lovely name. To, <laughs> it, it opens up the mouth. And, and, uh, well, the word of the Lord came to this governor and the word of the Lord, now this governor actually had, was, was going to be used by God to rebuild the temple. So God had a tremendous task in line for him. And the word was, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. This incredible task that lay before Zerubbabel was not one that he was to accomplish on his own might, on his own power. God wanted it clear that it was to be by God's Spirit. And whenever we think that the wonderful works that we do in the name of the Lord are by our own might, are by our own power, are by our own intellect, are by the work of our own will and the force of our own energy, that's when we've lost it. That's when we're, we're way off the deep end. And we need to remember that it's only by the Spirit of God. Only by the Spirit of God can we stand. Only by the Spirit of God can anything good come of any of our attempts. That was pride. Next one is distractions. And distractions can come in different forms. We can be distracted by our circumstances. Elijah was incredibly rattled by Queen Jezebel's threat. And it was, he was so rattled that God needed to take him aside and recommission him. He, was, he had given up. He was so rattled by the circumstances. Distractions can come in other forms. Our own plans can be a distraction. And I think of when Joshua was on his way to Jericho. Joshua was on his way to defeat Jericho. And he was going through his own plans, his own, his own um, battle uh, uh, strategies. And it says in chapter 5, when Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. So Joshua, in fact, was approaching Jericho, and he didn't even notice until he finally lifted up his eyes. And in fact, who was in front of him except it was the commander of the army of the Lord was standing right there in front of him with his sword drawn. And of course, Joshua, his his own plans were, well, who is this? He didn't recognize him. He didn't know who he was. He's either going to be for me or he's going to be for my adversaries. And so he asked him, are you for us or for our adversaries? And 
the commander of the army of the Lord gave him an interesting response. His response was, no. That wasn't one of the options. You're either for me or you're for my adversaries. Well, in fact, the commander of the army of the Lord wasn't so much concerned with being for one or the other. He said, no. And then he went on to say, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord, and now I have come. And when Joshua heard that, he fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. And then he proceeded to give him God's battle plan it wasn't his own anymore. It was God's plan. Sometimes we can be so focused on the task at hand that we don't even notice the Lord standing right in front of us. In Joshua's case, the Lord reminded him that he needed to be on the Lord's side rather than the Lord being on his side. The third one is presumption. We sometimes presume things about God that aren't necessarily true. Elijah maybe presume that God's only about the, all the theatrics, the booming voice, all the spectacular. And it took that low whisper. Maybe all we need is that impression in our spirit. Maybe not even an audible voice at all. And that's what we really need. A sense of that still, small moving of the Spirit. Sometimes we presume that just having those divine encounters is sufficient. Like Elijah, he met with an angel twice, met with God, but that alone isn't sufficient. We, we don't just say, oh yes, I... I, I went to the altar, and, and, I, and I cried, and, and, and I jumped, and, and, and no, it's, I mean, that's wonderful, but, but what do you do with it? Where do you take it? And, and so it, it was God's transformation. It was God's piercing question. It was God's revealing that he's not just the God of the theatrics. In fact, he actually is a God who can walk with us with that voice. And so we don't just presume that God is, is just in that one encounter and, and I can just walk away from that. No, it's on that daily level of continuing. This is the way. We sometimes presume that God will entrust us with big tasks even though we have not been faithful with the little ones. Oh, God, I'll do anything for you. Anything you say, take out the garbage. And anything, Father, <laughs> what, whatever your word is, take out the garbage. Oh, Lord, I, I received a word. You want me to take the gospel to Anchorage? I will do that for you, Lord. I don't know where Anchorage is. I hope it's in the Caribbean, but, but yes, I'll pack my things. Oh, oh Lord, I, I just want to follow your will. Follow your steps. Clean the kitchen. Oh, oh, Lord. Lord, are you speaking to me? Clean the kitchen. Oh, oh, Lord. Oh, I, I don't know why, but you want me to start my own religion? Okay, here we go. I'm going to start it right now. Oh, Lord, my, my life isn't going so well, but, but take my life. Take it and I'll go in any direction you say, any direction you want. Work in the nursery. Oh, oh, work in the nursery. Oh, okay. Okay, Lord. I, I 
didn't really want to continue at university anyway. And so you want me to quit university? Yes, yes, there, there I am. I'm going to res resign right now. You see, sometimes if, we, if God sees us as faithful with the little things, you know that little Say Yes campaign we just heard from? If, if we're faithful in whatever small things. When I, when I came in this morning, I was walking through the auditorium, and I saw a team of people arranging each chair here. They were going through each row. I'm sure they were probably praying as they were doing it. Arranging the chairs in the auditorium. Someone has to do it. And those people are being faithful with the little things. Jesus said, one who is faithful with very little is also faithful in much. Another thing that I'm very guilty of presuming is that God is okay with a little disobedience once in a while. He kind of winks at it if we're just not fully disobedient. I'm not fully obedient. Maybe, maybe I'm, I'm, I'm 98% devoted to God, but, but I'm just going to hold back on that 2%. And we presume that because God is continuing to bless us, that he's okay with that tiny bit of disobedience in our lives. The Lord warns us against presuming that his blessing and his faithfulness is a sign that he's still with us. Oh, Father, forgive us. Oh, Father, forgive us for, for those moments where we give in to the flesh. Those moments where we give ourselves over to those other voices. Oh, Father, please, please cleanse our hearts. Wipe us clean, Father, that, that we will not have even the tiniest bit of disobedience in our hearts that we would be wholeheartedly devoted. That when we call Jesus Lord, that that truly means that we do what Jesus says. We walk as Jesus walked. We live the life that you've called us to live 100%. Forgive us for presumption. When God met with Elijah, God gave him what he needed. And God graciously and lovingly recommissioned Elijah. And if you continue reading in verses 15 to 18, <coughs> excuse me, you'll see that there was going to be a new king in Israel, and Elijah would be anointing him. Elijah also received an exit strategy. God said, anoint Elisha to be prophet in your place. And God also said a word of encouragement. By the way, I have 7,000 in Israel who have not bowed to Baal. Well, in 10 minutes... I'm going to ask you to do something that might make you feel a little uncomfortable. I guarantee it will not involve rolling down the aisles. It won't involve swinging from the light fixtures. And it definitely will not involve barking. Okay? No barking. All right? So what I will ask you to do is a symbolic gesture. 
that some people did, some people in the Bible even did, as they drew near to God to listen to him. In the Old Testament, we saw how some prophets, priests, and kings wore sackcloth. And so I went ahead and asked Pastor Gabe to bring sackcloth, enough for each and every one of us to... No, no, we're not going to be putting on sackcloth. <clears throat> There's those in the Bible who took a Nazarite vow. You might recall Samson had a Nazarite vow. Abstain from wine, don't even eat grapes, don't cut your hair, and don't go near a dead body. That was a sign of devotion to God. John the Baptist, he wore camel's hair. Do you remember what John the Baptist ate? Locusts. Do you think he boiled them or roasted them on a stick? When I, when I thought of that, I, I just got this weird feeling of something in my teeth. I don't know, locusts. But that was, he was showing his devotion to God. Fortunately, I don't have any locusts to hand out. Um, the Apostle Paul spent three years in the desert. We recall Moses and Elijah also spent some time in the desert and went to the mountain of God. So you might be wondering, well, what sort of symbolic gesture would I be asking you to draw near to God to listen to him? But hey, that's eight minutes from now. We don't need to be concerned with something so far into the future. So we can just sit back, be a little complacent. Don't worry about those things. So the thing is that when we approach God now, it's different from when Moses and Elijah approached God. In their case, God would pass by them. And that was as close as they could get to him. And if, in our case, we have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. There's a huge difference between the two. Now, that, there's a condition on that. You need to have a relationship with God to have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And I want to remind you, Romans 3.23 tells us that everyone has sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Moses wanted to see God's glory. Because of our sin, we can't get near that. Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin, the payment that we receive because of our sin is death. But God offers a free gift, nothing that we could possibly earn, a free gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then Romans 10 and 9 says that if we confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, then we will be saved. And finally, my, one of my favorite Bible passages <coughs> is 1 John 1, 9. That if we confess our sins. And this is one passage that I quote to myself quite often. If we confess our sins. If I confess my sins. He is faithful. He is just. To forgive me and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And I want to pause for a moment right now. Oh, Father, search my heart. I don't want anything separating me from you. Search my heart, Lord. Forgive me for disobedience. Forgive me for pride. Forgive me for being presumptuous. 
cleanse me and breathe the Holy Spirit into my heart. Amen. And you see, <coughs> when, when God breathes the Holy Spirit into us, and that, that's what he did on Resurrection Sunday. He breathed the Spirit into the disciples. When he breathed the Spirit into them, he commissioned them as well. He said in John 20, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And then he breathed into them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit is our helper. Jesus promised that he will teach us all things and bring us to remembrance the things that he has said to us. So we can listen to the Holy Spirit living right inside of us. What sort of things does God say when we listen to him? Well, the first thing he'll say is, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. It's not because of our own righteousness. It's just because he loves us. He might lead us with a question. What are you doing here? He might. Maybe he'll give us a simple reminder of who we are in him and who he is. I recall that I, many years ago I was facing a crisis and I was, I was despondent. I was defeated. And I was at a prayer meeting and I was pouring my heart out to God at this prayer meeting. And I was weeping bitterly. And I had a vision. Now, I don't recall getting very many visions, but this time I had a vision. And I was, as I was pouring my heart out to God, it wasn't what he said to me, but it was what he showed me. And you know what he showed me? He showed me a giant shoulder to cry on. A giant, and I just lost it. He knew what I needed, and he met me right where I was at. God earnestly wants to meet with each and every one of us today and every day. And so I'd like you to do something as an outward sign of an inward desire. Maybe pride's been keeping you from listening to God. Show God that you want to humble yourself before him. When the Israelites went to Mount Horeb, they removed their jewelry as a sign of humility. Maybe distractions have been keeping us from listening to God. Show God that you want to focus on him by laying aside any handheld devices or any other electronic distractions. Maybe we need to delete a few accounts and some apps. Maybe our presumptions about God's holiness, about God's plans, about how God wants to work in us. Maybe they've been keeping us from listening to God. Let's show God that we want to think less of ourselves and our plans and show him a desire to see him glorified. Maybe we need to remove our shoes or put a cloth over our face as Elijah did. And so, in a minute, I'm going to walk off this platform and I'm going to go back to my seat and I'm going to remove my shoes and I'm going to stand in God's presence as though I'm at Mount Horeb, the mountain of God, and the holy ground. And I'm going to listen. If you want to pray in the Spirit, I would encourage you to do so, but do it under your breath. And so in a few seconds, 
I'm going to invite you as well to maybe remove shoes, remove jewelry, put down a handheld device or something, and either stand or kneel, or whatever else you feel the Lord leading you to do, to put you into that position to allow God to show you something, to reveal himself to you. 